physical media matters, movie theaters matter, and truly maybe one of the reasons why I really invested years and years and, and other people's money into bringing this movie theater back just so that I could do this with you and Jim Dante tonight. Um, among other things I love so much is our wonderful director of programming, Amanda Salazar, who is so much more eloquent than I am. And I'd like to bring her down now. Thank you very much. Before we get into the evening that we're all about to experience, I have to say something about this incredible woman because there's a reason we programmed this movie this month for the 35th anniversary, and that's because it's Maggie McKee's birthday. So, I love this movie, and I will just, I'm usually not at a loss for words, but there is like no amount of words, no like adjectives that can completely like describe the powerhouse that is that woman and what she did to build this space that we're in today. Um, getting to work with her, getting to know her, getting to be your friend, be a part of the family. She is magnetic, energetic. She's got fucking grit, man. <laughs> she can go to this place. And it's such a pleasure to be in a temple of cinema here at Eagle Rock with all of you in the community. So, because I feel like we were all like, we have the voice to do it. We do not need to sing happy birthday. I'm not going to ask you to do that. But I do feel like we get a real guttural, like, hardcore emo scream out of us. Just scream happy birthday, Maggie. So will you do that with me today? Yeah. It's all, right. all right, on the count of three. One, two, three. Happy birthday! So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a friendly audience. Wonderful. 
Well, so then take us back to when you got the script, and what did you think of it, where you were at, what you were excited about when you read the page and thought, I'm gonna make this movie. This was the first movie from Ron Howard and Brian Grazer's Imagine Pictures, and it was gonna be their main effort. And since Grumman's I had done for Steven Spielberg, and that was his first and one picture, I think they must have figured, well, we're gonna start a company, let's get this guy to do a picture, maybe it'll, maybe it'll work out. Uh, and um, the interesting thing about it was that it was scheduled to be shot uh, during a writer's strike. So luckily, the, the, the script was good. They wrote the script and everybody liked it. Uh, but it, as it turned out, we were the only picture shooting uh, that in that period, that couple of months um, in Hollywood because it, it, everybody had shut down. So, uh, and we couldn't make any changes in the script when we, uh, when we started to shoot it. And so we figured, well, what if we just shoot it in sequence? And then if we make up stuff, if the actors had live, if we decide to go a different way with the story, we can, we can make it work because, you know, we'll be discovering the characters as we shoot the picture. And because we were in an enclosed area, which is the Universal Act Lab, if you've been on the tour, uh, you'll see that that area is still there. Uh, it's, uh, it, it was used in, most recently in Desperate Housewives, um, but it goes back a long way. And we turned it, we, we built another house in the middle of the street and turned it into a cul-de-sac, and we shot the entire movie in this one spot. So uh, the, the actors worked every day, and we had a wonderful time, us and the deer and the raccoons, because that's really always there, except it's right near the Jaws ride. And so if you listen really hard, Sometimes you can hear, help, help, it's the shark, help, help. <laughs> oh, I hope that we, Mike, in the booth, maybe turn it up a little bit. <laughs> That's incredible. So speaking of that, when you had the actors and you have all there in this one set, um, what are some of the things that you, like, you're saying that you just mentioned that kind of came to life for you and for the actors in those moments? Well, we, because we, we had started with the concept that the, Tom Hanks' character is not at work. Uh, he's taking vacation, uh, and um, he wants to stay at home. His wife wants him to go to the lake, but he wants to stay there. And he gets, a, he gets in trouble with his neighbors who are goofy. Uh, and they all, they all decide that there's some people on the block that, uh, that they're kind of suspicious and they just moved in and they're not like us. Uh, and. Uh, the, the interesting thing for me was that I had lived, I, I grew up in a neighborhood in New Jersey where there was a house with people in it. The people said, oh, we don't go in there, those people are weird. They never come out of it. Uh, and, and when we were making the movie, we talked to all the people that we were working with, and, and almost everybody had a story about a house in their neighborhood at one point in their lives where people said, oh, don't go to that house. That's, that's where the weird people live. And of course, you know, there's weird and there's weird. So, you know, it, sometimes it's just you don't know who they are or they're not like you. Uh, and, you know, there, there's a dramatic version of this picture where the neighbors are black. And it's, but it's not funny. Because <laughs> luckily everybody's homogenous and so it's still funny. But it's, it's about the other, it's about fear of the other. And uh, anybody who's not like everybody else is suspicious. And uh, the, the, it brings a couple of changes on that as, as we go through. Uh, but if you've seen the movie, uh, in the, the original ending of the picture was that the lead character ended up getting killed by the bad people. And uh, when we hired Tom Hanks, <laughs> the first thing they said was, we can't kill Tom Hanks. <laughs> and we gotta figure out what, what are those people doing in that, in that weird house? What are all those lights and that strange noises? But we have to explain that now. And that, of course, we had never intended to explain it. Um, but it was uh, because because the actors really were into the movie, and the, a lot of the movie is literally ad libs. Some of the funniest lines wow. in the picture are just lines that people said in the middle of a take. Sometimes not even on camera. Um, but it was, uh, it was it was it was it was really a lot of fun to make because they left us completely alone because everybody everybody was on strike. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Um, can you take us back then to a little bit of, I mean, the production design of this film is so unique. I mean, as we can see with sardines on pretzels here. Um, and granted, you worked within a set that was already built, but can you talk about creating that world? Because it's just so <laughs> vibrant and intricate and layered. 
in every scene. There's from the cereal boxes, if you know what I'm talking about. Well, there's a, there's a lot of art direction in the movie, but we didn't have to do a lot because the the particular area we were shooting at, which used to be on the bottom of the back lot, and it was universally used to have the best uh, neighborhood uh, back lot ever. And then Anna Stevens Spielberg built Hamlet, and they had to they they built it right where the back lot was. So they had all these houses. And they said, well, we got it. We don't want to take them. Well, we'll take them and put them all up on the hill together. But the problem is the houses are from movies from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And the architecture is wildly different. And so there's something just off about it. And as a result, it's got this sort of fairy tale Hollywood kind of look to it. Because the original idea for this picture was that they wanted to shoot it in a real location like in Arizona. And uh, I said, you know, this, this is sort of like Gremlins. I mean, it's a movie that really only works if it's kind of heightened, like heightened reality. It's sort of stylized. It's like, it should look like a movie. You know, it should look like real life, because what these people are doing is, it's reprehensible. <laughs> only, it's only gonna work if it's, if it's, you know, got some stylization to it. And so, as a result, it's a, um, it's a very unusual neighborhood. I mean, uh, you know, Corey Feldman lives in the Monster House. <laughs> we, don't, we don't say that, but if you've never seen the Monster House, that's it. Uh, but we, but we, we couldn't change it. It's there, there it was. So we just had to buy into it. Wow. And then, and then going into the houses, can you talk a little bit about that as well? Because that's the external facing that you're right, the, 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 the tone and the set. But then inside, it's so unique in many ways. Well, we had to build the inside of the, the house of the the Clopex, or the, the, the creepy neighbors. And um, interestingly, uh, Brother Theodore, who plays one of the Clopex, who is a, um, uh, he's a wonderful guy. He was, he was a, a performance artist, really. And he had gone through very bad things during the war, and he had tattoos, and he was uh, and he had quite, a, quite a history. But he was also deaf, he was so deaf. And so whenever we would have scenes, uh, we would we rehearse, and the actors would have to yell their lines out so that he would get his cue. Uh, and there was something about <laughs> Brother Theodore that just made that whole family, which is wildly different people, Henry Gibson and Courtney Gaines, these people don't look like they came from the same mother at all. Uh, there was just something about them that was so cohesive, even though they were all weird. Uh, that it's um, it, it was just it was fun to go to work every day, like and, and, and on some movies it's not fun to go to work, but in this one it was always fun to go to work. <laughs> well, speaking of like cohesive and weird at the same time, can we talk about the cast? Because I think that also defines the rest of the cast as well. It seems very cohesive. It seems very friendly, and I'm just so curious about kind of getting such an incredible cast for this film. So, obviously, Carrie Fisher, wonderful in this, right? Very understatable, she's remarkable, we were talking about um, Bruce Stern, we have, obviously, Tom Hanks. Can you just talk about casting? For well, we have people that I've used before. I mean, Wendy Shaw plays Bruce's uh, wife, and he's, uh, I've used her many times, and she's so very fun. Uh, and Dick Miller, of course, is in it, and Bob Ricardo, and, you know, my, my usual suspects. <laughs> uh, all of whom are people that you, you you make movies with people and you hire them because you think they're good and then you work with them and you realize, wow, this is really, I, I, love, I love these people, I want to work with them again. Right. And then the problem is every time you get a script, you go, you got all these people you want to try to plug into this movie and you can't do it because sometimes they're just not right for, you know, I mean, Dick Butler's not going to be playing the President of the United States, so. <laughs> so we love, we love him, though. He's so remarkable with all of your films. I mean, but, but if you, you if, if you're going to if you can figure out a way to get these people in the movie and uh, in the right roles, uh, they just they just make it so much better, make my job so much easier. I mean, I don't you don't if you cast a movie correctly, you don't have to do a lot of directing. Uh, if you don't cast it directly, you do have to do a lot of directing. And a lot of times, uh, people have spent the whole movie trying to overcome the mistake they made casting a, a person. I've never had that problem because I, I love actors and all the actors I've worked with always wanted to work with me again. So uh, it's just a matter of trying to find enough jobs so you can keep your actor friends working. Well, speaking of one of those actors, I believe we have a special guest that was going to join us, or at least say hello. Um, give us a moment. 
The door is opening, I promise. Don't turn your heads, don't do it. <laughs> Stay up here, stay with us. Um, all right, I believe we have um, Corey Feldman's gonna be here. <laughs> to the burbs. I was like, oh, I should check that movie out. You know what I'm saying? Mark the Marquee. That's my house. Exactly, exactly. No, actually, a, a friend, I guess, of whoever put this event on, uh, messaged me on Instagram last night and said, there's this event tomorrow night. Joe Dante is going to be there. It's an anniversary. And I said, well, we've been talking about getting together, so what a perfect opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> maybe one question of you, um, what that experience was like on set for you. Bring us back to the Burbs and tell us about that time. <laughs> well, uh, you know, Burbs was actually at a, a crossroads in my life, so not the easiest period of time. Uh, we all have our ups and downs. Life is a bit of a roller coaster. This year has been exceedingly difficult for me personally, uh, but my career is doing great, so it's kind of you know, you never get it all. <laughs> Don't ever think that you're gonna ever have, you know, uh, a life of, of rose petals all the way to the door, because it just doesn't work that way. But, that said, during the period of the burbs, uh, I was kind of going through a transition and about to fall off a very deep, dark edge and kind of teetering on that edge. And, you know, thanks to Joe and, and Carrie Fisher, who pulled me aside one day and said, you're about to go over that edge. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was a rebellious kid. I, I, I was a lot like the character in the movie at that point. Uh, so it was, uh, it was also very uh, challenging for me from an artistic standpoint, given that I come from the land of like doing these movies where I was very fast on my feet, I was making up a lot of dialogue, I was improvising a lot. But then all of a sudden I'm in this world with these guys who are like Rick Dukeman and Tom Hanks who are professional comedians and have a lot more experience than I did. So all of a sudden I felt, you know, diminished, very, very demonized to, uh, you know, a small uh, ego, I guess you would say. My ego got very small, but at the same time as, as with most kids who are teenagers, you know, they kind of project that out. So even though I was feeling insecure, I was probably acting uh, more egotistical. So the point being, I, I uh, you know, I, I, I had a lot of trouble accepting my worth on that set. I guess uh, you probably would have noticed that, but, <laughs> um, but you know, luckily, luckily Joe and I made up and, and I made it up to him by doing a, another film together called Splatter. Uh, which was actually the first streaming horror flick for Netflix with, with Roger Corman. So, all was good in the hood. Corey <laughs> was the first person that I cast in the movie because I thought, I read the script and I said, Corey had worked with him before on, uh, on Grunt. Uh, he was much younger then. And he was, his scene with Gizmo in Brownlands, where he talks to him on the bed, is one of the best scenes in the movie. Because he was, these, these puppets only come to life when the actors make you think that they're real. And he talked to this puppet like it was a puppy. And I just remember thinking, boy, he's really such a good actor, you know? And uh, so when it came time to read this script, I went, this kid, this, 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 Stoner kid is this is Corey, and uh, it, 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 a couple of people said, "Well, I mean, you know, Corey Feldman. I mean, you know, he's kind of in a lot of trouble." And, 
And I said, well, I could work with him. I think he's, I think, and, and it, in the end, it was, it was a perfect choice. Nobody could have played this part as well as he did. One more surprise. Uh, I brought with another member of the cast. Unfortunately, they're in the bag. Come here. That's gross. Joe, see, oh, actually, two more surprises. I brought you a gift. Corey Feldman.